Okay, welcome back. We, we are ready for the third lecture by Robert Wald. Okay, let me uh, check the microphone again. Is that reasonable? Okay, again, well, this time people are even nodding. Uh, so. Okay, so this is the third talk which I'm gonna be talking about dynamic and thermodynamic stability of black holes, but let me back up uh, the, to the last few slides of the previous talk, which I rushed through in the last minute or two, because that kind of summarizes uh, where we are and will also indicate where we're going, although, uh, so, uh, again, you can, Think of some, I mean, you can think of a, of a black hole that settles down to a stationary final state as being certainly in a way analogous to a body in ordinary, you know, non-general relativistic physics in your laboratory, you know, a, a box that you've just filled with a gas, uh, if you wait a while, it will settle down into a thermal equilibrium state. I will talk more about that, in fact, uh, today. And something I didn't uh, emphasize, I mentioned it very quickly right at the end when I was rushing to go through these slides, but just as bodies in thermal equilibrium, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes, are characterized by some small number of state parameters for this box of gas, just the energy. Well, the only thing that's really important about the box is its volume as far as the properties of this particular system of gas is concerned. The number of particles in the gas would be another state parameter. Uh, well, analogously to that, it is a non-trivial fact that in general relativity in four space-time dimensions, uh, there are the stationary black holes comprise only a small family by, uh, parameterized by, well, in the vacuum case, parameterized only by two parameters, mass and angular momentum. I mean, Nico has already told you a lot about Kerr black holes. That's what I'm talking about, they're the unique stationary vacuum solutions of Einstein's equation, at least in four dimensions. If we allow electromagnetic fields, which I won't be talking about, but I'm just including it here for generality, uh, then uh, black holes could also have a net electric charge. And the results I showed you already about black holes are really remarkably direct analogs of standard laws of thermodynamics. Now, why these laws of thermodynamics are called the laws of thermodynamics, I mean, is more historical or what, uh, what, but anyway, they are features of thermodynamics. I mean, I, whether they should be considered the fundamental principles of thermodynamics or not, I think one could argue about, but it's, Anyway, this is a nice way of comparing the two. I've, there is a so-called zeroth law of thermodynamics, which, uh, well, really says that if you have a body that's locally in equilibrium, you can define a notion of temperature. I think it's usually assumed that all the matter one is considering on very small scales has reached equilibrium. Uh, and then to globally be in a true equilibrium state, the temperature of that body has to be constant. Well, in black hole physics, if we have a stationary black hole, then as I explained in the first lecture, its event horizon will be a killing horizon. And in that context where the black hole is stationary, uh, we can define the notion of, a surf of surface gravity, and then it's a non-trivial theorem that that surface gravity has to be constant over the event horizon of the, of the, of the black hole. What I spent uh, the, the entire lecture 
uh, last time telling you was that there is a first law of black hole mechanics. Uh, I didn't include electromagnetic fields. I didn't in thereby include charge and the potential at the horizon uh, in the derivation. So you can ignore this term, but I'm, as I say, I'm putting it in for to show you the further generality that one can, uh, one can derive this in the same manner as I did if you add electromagnetic fields as matter. So that law said that, in fact, uh, the variation in mass and angular velocity of the horizon times variation of angular momentum which was this surface term we got from infinity uh, integrating this identity or this equation involving the symplectic product of, uh, of an arbitrary perturbation with a gauge transformation, taking the diffeomorphism to be the horizon killing field. We got a surface term at infinity, which was the difference between those terms, and we got a surface term at the horizon which I explained would evaluate to this in general relativity. Um, but this then is a formula that says if you have a stationary black hole and perturb it, the change in its mass and change in angular momentum, and if you include this, change in electric charge, will be related to the change in the area uh, of the event horizon of the black hole. Uh, this is very analogous to first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics will always have a variation of the energy uh, term here, and it'll have temperature times variation of entropy uh, appearing here. And then what appears here depends on what systems you're considering. I've written it for a box of gas or whatever, but uh, you know, these are often referred to as work terms or something. They're of exactly the same character as these terms. If you considered a rotating system in thermodynamics, you'd have a term just like this. If you considered a charge system in thermodynamics, you'd also have a term just like uh, that. So these are remarkably analogous. And then even more uh, remarkable is uh, the analogy between the area theorem that I explained to you again the very first uh, lecture, which is, says that the, simply says that the area of the event horizon of a black hole never decreases with time. There aren't very many laws of that character of physics laws that tell you things are non-decreasing with time. One of them is the second law of thermodynamics, which says which asserts that entropy is non-decreasing. So this is a remarkable analogy. And if you look at the analogous uh, quantities, well, I mean, I've written them in a form where you can kind of read off the analogous quantities. And I mean, let's not forget the uh, the advance and the, the laser pointer is working, but the, uh, the, the laser pointer part is, but that isn't now. I don't know, because it has maybe to do with the... Yeah. Well, we can look at this slide for the analogous quantities are mass and, uh, well... Uh, just disappear, the, yeah. No? Yeah? Okay. I have no idea what happened, but... Okay, yeah. So let's not forget the zeroth law that has surface gravity and temperature is analogous. Uh, now we've got... Well, we have area and entropy as being analogous, and uh, 
They come in the same way with surface gravity and temperature. We have mass and energy as analogous, and then we have these various work terms. So one thing that's also quite striking is that mass and energy are the same quantity, the same physical quantity uh, in uh, general relativity. On the other hand, uh, the temperature of a black hole in classical general relativity is clearly absolute zero, so the physical temperature, so that would seem not to have a lot to do with surface gravity in, in terms of, I mean, the mathematical relationship is perfect as I described it, but the physical relationship isn't, and then that would also call into question uh, perhaps whether one should take seriously the idea that area should physically represent entropy. So I will return to these issues uh, in the last talk, if, if we finish early, uh, I'll even start it maybe in, uh, in this talk. Uh, but I'm going to move on now to staying within classical general relativity, extending this analogy actually considerably further uh, in terms of, well, going beyond just sort of first law stuff and actually showing you that thermodynamic stability, which I'll have to uh, define for you, is in fact equivalent to dynamic stability of a, of a black hole in general relativity. Now I, I'm in this talk, I will restrict to general relativity rather than a, an arbitrary theory of gravity, but I will allow the dimension to be arbitrary, which will be useful for getting more examples than just the Kerr black hole. But before I start on this, I thought, since I didn't really leave time for discussion and questions uh, at the end of last talk, this might be, I mean, since I've just summarized uh, the main conclusions, uh, just if anyone had any questions before I go on, any reasonably quick questions, because I shouldn't end this in a rush. Okay, so what I, uh, what I'm gonna talk about now here is, well, stability of black holes, and also for reasons that are very important in terms of extending the thermodynamic analogy, I'm gonna talk about black brains, which I'm gonna define in a second. So black holes, well, in four dimensions, Kerr black holes are physically very relevant, and one would like, well, one believes they're physically relevant, but they wouldn't be unless they're stable. That is, if you perturb them, they will go back to being Kerr black holes, maybe with slightly different parameters, but they won't disintegrate or become naked singularities or, uh, and become naked singularities or do uh, um, other things. And I think I don't really have to motivate, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that understanding the stability of black holes is something uh, of interest. By a black brain in this talk, I'm just going to mean some higher dimensional, so uh, dimension D, which would be the dimension of the black hole where we wanna, we wanna consider, uh, plus some extra spatial dimension space-time. So, if we have a black hole in D dimensions described by a metric ds squared D that I've written down, I, that's only supposed to tell you that I have a metric in mind here. I, have, I, I don't know, writing it down may not be the, quite the proper terminology. But anyway, if I add extra flat dimensions, so just add, uh, uh, take the Cartesian product of whatever manifold I had here with RP and with the flat metric on RP, that's what I mean by a black brain. So that's a solution. That'll be obviously a solution of Einstein's equation if this was uh, in D plus P dimensions. Of course, it's not asymptotically flat, but you'll see why I want to consider these because at least from the point of view of thermodynamic stability, they'll be interesting. And what I'm gonna introduce based on the formalism that I uh, 
showed you in the last talk is a quantity called the canonical energy, which I will argue, uh, or show, well, show slash argue, uh, the positivity of this quantity in the case of axisymmetric perturbations, rotationally symmetric perturbations. I'll explain where that restriction comes from uh, in due course. Uh, that is a, the positivity of this quantity. It's a quantity quadratic in the perturbation of the black hole. The, if this is positive for all perturbations, then the black hole is stable, at least in some sense. And if this quantity is not positive definite uh, on all perturbations of the black hole, uh, or is not positive, then, then uh, the black hole will be unstable in a certain sense. More specifically, if this is non-negative, uh, then it's fairly straightforward to show that there don't exist any exponentially growing linear perturbations. So that's a weaker result than the black hole. Non-existence of exponentially growing modes is a weaker result than linear stability, but it's, it's at least a result very much in that direction. And on the other hand, uh, if, this can be, if this canonical energy can be made negative for, for any allowed perturbation, then uh, that perturbation, uh, if you gave the initial data for that perturbation, it could not settle down to a stationary black hole state at late times. Uh, so in that sense, the black hole would have to be unstable. And in fact, if that perturbation is of the form of a time derivative of another perturbation, then you can prove there has to be, in, in, in fact, an exponentially growing solution. So, uh, I mean, this, I think, is of some interest, definitely for just the general study of black hole stability. I mean, you just have a single quantity uh, that whose positivity or lack thereof is in these weak senses telling you about the stability. But what uh, I'm, the reason I'm giving a, uh, you know, spending one of my th four lectures on this is that I'm going to show you that the positivity of this quantity is, in fact, precisely necessary and sufficient for thermodynamic stability of a black hole. And that really relates further the dynamic and thermodynamic properties of black holes and, uh, well, further indicates the uh, I mean, basically, if the area is a maximum for a, the given is a local maximum for uh, what I'm saying here is if the area, which represents the entropy, is locally maximum, you know, in terms of second variation for fixed uh, mass and angular momentum, then your black hole is stable for fixed mass, angular momentum, and charge if you have those uh, um, parameters. Uh, so I'm, again, I'm going to be using the general formalism that I introduced last lecture. So that really uh, would, a lot of what I'm saying applies to uh, other theories of gravity, but the specific uh, uh, results and certainly the, you know, particular form of the canonical energy will just be for general relativity. However, there's no difficulty doing that in d dimensions. And then it's quite easy to include matter fields and also other asymptotic conditions, uh, asymptotically ADS, et cetera. Uh, um, you know, there's, that, that's a completely straightforward generalization of the things that I'm saying. OK. So the hard part, I think the hard part of yesterday's uh, talk was explaining the notation and the framework or something. And the hard part of this talk is explaining, is 
forgot about general relativity for now, just what do we mean by thermodynamic stability and where, does, where do those notions arise from? Okay, well, as long as you know how to fix it, we'll be okay. I'll be on this slide for a few minutes anyway. Okay, so now we're in the context of out of general relativity, ordinary uh, physics, and I want to consider a finite system, but a system, of course, with a very large number of degrees of freedom uh, that has a time translationally invariant dynamic. So it has a Hamiltonian that's time independent. Okay, then automatically the energy, which is just the value of the Hamiltonian, will be conserved. There may be some other conserved quantities, and there may be some also just some parameters in the Hamiltonian. You might be putting your system in an external magnetic field, and the magnetic field might then be a parameter appearing in the Hamiltonian or whatever. So there will be some number of, well, energy always will be there, but there may also be some additional state parameters, as they're called, that will be unchanged during the dynamical evolution. I mean, maybe you'll want to change your magnetic field, but I'm going to analyze what's going to go on with the magnetic field constant, then you can change it later after we've done the analysis uh, to do, if you want to do an experiment with that. So underlying uh, the thermodynamics is the idea, and statistical physics for that matter, I mean, is the idea that if, so now I'm drawing phase space here. This is not space time or anything like that. We're putting that aside for a minute. But this whole board is phase space. Uh, over here, I'm looking at some surface where these state parameters are constant. Well, if these are parameters in the Hamiltonian, then they're just constant anyway, but you know, we might have a conserved angular momentum or some other uh, conserved quantity here. So the, the dynamical trajectories are going to live. Uh, this is a dynamical trajectory now that I'm drawing on this energy shell. Let's just pretend that energy is the only parameter. So we just have an energy shell in phase space uh, that I'm drawing here. The key underlying assumption is that uh, this trajectory is, well, I use the term that I made up, effectively ergodic. Uh, this. Uh, it, well, it, it typically won't be literally true that this orbit passes arbitrarily close to every point on the energy shell. And if it did, that wouldn't really be too relevant to physics anyway, because the amount of time it would take to get close to every point is way longer than any observation time in any laboratory. But the idea is that this does kind of fill up uh, the energy shell in phase space, or it inhabits a good sampling of the energy shell in phase space. Uh, and it, 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 well, if you have strong assumptions about the ergodic behavior and average over all time, it is a theorem, well, that, that under strong hypotheses, that in fact the amount of time that any orbit will spend in a given volume will be proportional to that volume, right? So systems will tend to spend equal times in equal volumes. So if I want to know what fraction of the time would I expect to find the system in the region that I've drawn, if I take the phase space volume on this energy shell of this region and divide by the volume of the energy shell, 
that, is, that should be the right answer. And I'm going to assume that's the right answer in, in what I mean by effectively ergodic. Again, this is definitely not mathematics here. It's argument. Well, I mean, there's plenty of mathematics in ergodic theory and in various theorems of this sort, but in the application here. OK, so now the key idea in, well, certainly with regard to the second law of thermodynamics and so on, is that, uh, I mean, again, this is a system with a huge number of degrees of freedom, which, I mean, nobody could keep track of, but even if one could, it wouldn't, one wouldn't typically want to. What one is interested in is what you might call macroscopic observables. Now, what macroscopic observable you choose is up to you or whatever, I mean, but, you know, again, if you think of a box of gas, you're not going to uh, observe the positions and velocities of all of the gas molecules, but you're, you certainly may observe some average behavior of them. And the idea is that there will be a lot of, well, there will be a huge number of states in this phase space, I suppose I can color this in with some different color, uh, which with respect to at least the observable you're considering will be macroscopic, will be, I mean, I'm using the word macroscopic to refer to whatever reasonable observable you've chosen, will be macroscopically indistinguishable. Whereas, you know, over here, in this region, this might well be macroscopic, I mean, this is macroscopically distinguishable from this. So if you looked at the gas, you would notice the difference between it being in one of these states or in one of these states, but you wouldn't notice the difference between the gas being here or here, nor would you notice the difference between the gas being here or here. Okay, and so now with respect to this sort of coarse graining, well, the coarse graining is kind of by its nature discrete because I'm really talking about these states being indistinguishable. I mean, that will give some, you know, discrete volumes that are sort of declared to be indistinguishable. But I'm going to define, well, in the classical case, the entropy of any state like this one to be typically be a Boltzmann constant thrown in, but the log of the volume of the energy shell occupied uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, by all the states that are macroscopically indistinguishable from that. In the quantum case, which is I think what I've uh, written up there, then it would be the, just the logarithm of the discrete, the total number of discrete quantum states within some slightly thickened energy shell, uh, uh, you know, that would again be macroscopically, would, that would be indistinguishable with respect to the macroscopic-like observable that you've chosen. Okay, and now there will thereby get a function which I will then, I will now treat as though it was continuous or smooth, although it kind of has to be, you know, step function like the way I've defined it here, breaking things up into volumes. But, you know, all of the awkwardness is. Uh, mitigated substantially when you consider that you're, you know, you've got at least, you know, 10 to the 25th degrees of freedom in the system and so on. I mean, so, you know, it, it's, 
you know, it was a very high dimension thing, and, you know, uh, anyway. Uh, so I'm going to think of the entropy, well, as a function then on this energy shell. Let me put back in my XIs. I'm not sure why I took them out. You know, the other state parameters. And of course, you know, at other state parameters, I can do the same thing and define uh, the entropy there. Okay, so now I've gotten up to uh, what I mean by a thermal equilibrium state. So if I, oh, well, okay, before I do that, right, so this is the explanation of the second law of thermodynamics, namely, if you are starting out in a low entropy state like this one that you can see is low entropy because there's only a little volume on the energy shell of indistinguishable states and you start orbiting around, well, you're bound to enter. Again, you know, the disparity in volumes is typically incredibly enormous, again, in this high dimensions. So, but you're kind of bound to since you're spending equal times and equal volumes to evolve to a state that's much more, that, that corresponds to something that has much, much more phase space volume. So if you start in a low entropy state, you're bound to evolve to a higher entropy state. And what if you start in a high entropy state well, you're bound to just evolve around pretty much in that high entropy state. I mean, eventually, if you wait, you know, age of universe is way too short. If you wait a lot longer than that, yes, you'll evolve out of that and into this low entropy region. But you're, if you're in a high entropy, well, if you're in the maximum entropy state, you're going to stay there for all intents and purposes. And if you're in a low entropy state, you're going to evolve to higher entropy. So that's the, uh, you know, that is the explanation of the second law of thermodynamics just from the point of view of ordinary mechanics or whatever. Okay, but now I can define a thermal equilibrium state. Well, normally one would be concerned if in doing thermodynamics with stable thermal equilibrium states and really just consider uh, the maximum, uh, consider the, the maximum volume region, which would be essentially the volume, whose volume would be essentially the entire volume of the phase space and call that a thermal equilibrium state, but I, I'm, interested in unstable thermal or possibly unstable thermal equilibrium states as well. So what I'm going to consider is any, anything on this energy shell, uh, any point, region, or whatever that, is, that extremizes the entropy. Again, there is this disparity of thinking of entropy as a kind of, you know, step function-like thing and looking at extrema of it uh, and so on, and, and I'll be taking derivatives and so gradients of the entropy and so on. But again, in, you know, I, I mean, if you look at anything in physics, you know, on the Planck scale, it's probably not a smooth function, right? I mean, you've got some fudging to do in all cases. It's more blatant here, but I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and do the same sort of fudging. So, uh, so I'm going to call a state, of course, a state is a whole family of states because all of them are, you know, that have the same macroscopic observable are considered equivalent, but I'll consider a state uh, to be at an extremum, a, a therm I'll call it a thermal equilibrium state if the entropy does not vary to first order as I change, uh, uh, you know, as I move on the energy shell. So if you're in 
a, a thermal equilibrium state, well, by definition, things don't change when you move within the energy shell. That's my, or within the constant state parameter shell. So the only way it's going to change to first order is if you change the state parameters. So the, if we define, so we get the first law of thermodynamics as a completely empty kind of trivial statement out of this, which is just saying that the, uh, well, I can, the entropy is going to then at a thermal equilibrium state just depend on the state parameters. I, I mean, it's written in a slightly funny way. It would be better, a little clearer if I put the delta S on the left, put it as one over T times delta E and then had these other terms. But all I'm saying is that the variation, the first variation of S only depends on the state, on the change of the state parameters. And these uh, coefficients are just then the partial derivatives. So I happen to, in order to write this in the more conventional form, I've put delta E, uh, I've, I'm viewing E as a function of S and Xi uh, uh, around this thermal equilibrium state. But these are just the partial derivatives uh, that occur. And this relation, of course, holds for all perturbations because if you don't change the state parameters, to first order, you don't change the entropy by definition of what I mean by a thermal equilibrium state. Right? I warned you this was going to be the hard part of the talk, right? The, the, the... OK. So now we can define the notion of thermodynamic stability, which is that if on this energy shell, the S is a local maximum, not just an extremum, uh, but it's a local maximum uh, for, of course, variations on the energy shell. Now, I'm only going to second order variations, so I only have to keep the state parameters fixed to first and second order. Uh, if the entropy is a, is, is a maximum, then I will call this a stable ther thermal equilibrium state. And indeed, that state should be stable because the entropy is locally maximum. You'd have, to de you'd, you'd have to find a much smaller volume to evolve into uh, in order to get out of that thermal equilibrium. OK, well, maybe I'll go on and finish the thermodynamic stuff, and then I should stop uh, to see whether there are any questions about this, because as I say, the GR part will be quite easy, I think. This is the part that I think is incredibly unfamiliar to almost everybody, uh, and for which I don't know of terribly good treatments, and certainly not, not the standard thermodynamics or statistical physics textbooks or whatever. Uh, OK, but now I can, so this is my definition of thermodynamic stability, which should, you know, if my box of gas is in a thermodynamically stable state, then it should not be changing when I look at it. Uh, and in fact, shouldn't, if I perturb it a little bit it without changing the state parameters, it ought to go back to the way it was just by these ergodic-like arguments that I've just been making. OK, but I can rewrite this in a somewhat nicer way, because here I have to keep the state parameters fixed to first and second order. But in view of this first law identity, uh, if instead I consider this quantity, again, for purposes I've written, I, it would make a lot more sense to write the delta squared s and 1 over t delta squared e and so on. But if I look at this quantity, uh, this quantity doesn't, if I, if I allow myself to change the, the state parameters at second order, I'm, I'm not going to allow you to change the state parameters uh, 
at first order, but if I allow you to change them at second order, then the second order change, the, the change induced from that second order change is just going to be like this first order change that this first law applies to. And the change that I get from second order variations of the energy and the other state parameters is going to make this quantity zero. So if instead of, what I'm saying is that if instead of just looking for the entropy to be a maximum, if I look at this quantity and make that that second order variation, well, positive, because I put a minus sign here, then I can just check this for variations that just keep the state parameters fixed only at first order. So that's a nice technical advantage. OK, so I've been talking about finite systems, but in, uh, people like in thermodynamics to talk about spatially homogeneous systems which are necessarily infinite. They'd, of course, have infinite energy and so on, but you can define per unit volume uh, quantity, you know, corresponding quantities, and, of course, write down the same sort of laws and write, uh, make the same uh, sort of definitions. But now, if you want stability, uh, in, you know, in the, exactly the same sense of the entropy being locally maximum uh, at fixed state parameters. Well, we already had this criteria where we only had to fix the state parameters at first order, but now we don't really even have to fix the state parameters at first order uh, because in this infinite homogeneous system, we can always borrow, enter if, if we want to make a perturbation that decreases the energy, I can make a very long wavelength perturbation that decreases the energy in this region, but increases it further away. And the, the second order variations are not going to care about the sign of the change, you know, whether I increased or slight, slightly increased or slightly decreased. Uh, the energy, and again, if you make the wavelength big enough, the inhomogeneities that you're introducing are not going to matter. So uh, you need, you'll need this to hold uh, for thermodynamic stability, even if you consider perturbations that change the energy and state parameters at first order. So you get a sort of stronger criterion, necessary criteria, well, necessary and sufficient, really, but you, you get a, a stronger criteria for thermodynamic stability in this infinite system case. And indeed, a necessary condition then for thermodynamic stability is that, that in particular, when you do change the state parameters, when you just consider some change of state parameters, the entropy change better be negative. Uh, the entropy better be locally a maximum. So if you just look at this matrix of second derivatives, let's forget about the xi's and just worry about the second derivative of the entropy with respect to energy. That better be uh, uh, negative. Uh, in other words, if that is positive, or if this more generally, if this matrix has a positive eigenvalue, then you have thermodynamic instability. And again, the argument is that you need this, uh, you don't need to impose this restriction of fixing the state parameters at first order because of the ability to do this uh, interchange. So if we just consider the, the case of the energy is the only state parameter, this condition is equivalent to having, uh, well, this condition for instability is equivalent to having a negative heat capacity. So if you have any infinite system that has a negative heat capacity, so when you, if you add energy, that lowers the temperature, then that system is going to be thermodynamically unstable because uh, 
basically what's going to happen is part of the system, you can make part of the system a little hotter and part a little colder. Well, you can add energy to a part of it, uh, having taken it away from the other part, but this part is now going to get colder and more energy is going to flow from the colder part to the hotter pot part. I mean, that's the argument as to why with the infinite homogeneous system, uh, you need this condition and this negative heat capacity uh, is part of it. So, and a homogeneous system with a negative heat capacity has to be thermodynamically unstable. Okay, that is not true for a finite system. And stars in Newtonian gravity have a negative heat capacity. If you add energy to a star in just Newtonian gravity, well, or in general relativity, I mean, a nice stable star, uh, you know, like the sun except I don't want to have the source of thermonuclear energy at the center of the sun, so just imagine the, the sun as an equilibrium ideal gas-like uh, object. If I add energy to the sun, it will expand and cool, and its temperature will go down if I add energy. Uh, it has a negative heat capacity, but that has nothing to do with the thermodynamic or other stability of the sun because the Sun is not an infinite homogeneous system. But if you have an infinite homogeneous system, then this is a criteria. And that's why I want to consider the black brains, because they are homogeneous. I mean, they're homogeneous in some infinite direction, which is all you need to make this kind of argument. OK, so that's the hard part of the talk. And now we're on to the dynamic and thermodynamic stability of black holes, but let me pause for a minute to see if uh, if anyone is su sufficiently outraged by anything that I've said in the last, uh, well, nearly half hour probably talking about thermodynamic stability uh, and thermodynamic properties to complain vociferously. Yes. On the, I couldn't, chemical? Canonic, oh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get to that. That has nothing to do with the ordinary therm. That, that's when I'm going to talk about the rest, the remaining 40, 40 minutes. Yeah. OK. Well, why don't I move on? And you're probably more interested in black holes anyway. So we've just seen that black holes, and the same for black brains, are in fact thermodynamic systems with these analogous quantities. Uh, again, the other conserved quantities or state parameters would be angular momentum and charge if, charges if you have them. Uh, I've put a subscript I on angular momentum here because if we're in higher dimensions, then there are many independent planes, and so there can be you know, many independent angular momenta, but again, you can ignore that uh, if you want. So the, for a finite system, i.e. a black hole, the condition, if we take this analogy seriously and apply the thermodynamic results, uh, the condition for thermodynamic stability, I mean, this is really just a definition, so I suppose you can't really argue, would be that if you have perturbations that keep, well, I'm going to set the charges to zero now. If you keep the state parameters fixed uh, for all perturbations, then this quantity better be positive. I mean, that is the, if I take the condition I just described to you for thermodynamic stability and convert that to a condition for black holes, that's the condition. And what I'll show you is that this is, in fact, equal to the canonical energy. So the positivity of the canonical energy is, in fact, the, the condition for thermodynamic stability. But then I'll also show you that it is the condition in this weaker senses for dynamic stability. But 
black brains uh, are homogeneous, so we have this additional stronger criteria that this, that it'll be necessary for thermodynamic stability that uh, uh, this quantity, well, this matrix uh, be negative, negative definite, I guess, uh, or at least it can't be positive or can't admit a positive eigenvalue. And in fact, uh, for the black brain system, I will show you this condition also is uh, necessary for the canonical energy to be positive by exactly mirroring the thermodynamic argument I gave of borrowing energy or other state parameters from one part of the system to the other. Uh, and so that means that, uh, well, let me give you an application of this, which if that, this doesn't motivate any interest, I'm probably not going to succeed in, 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 in motivating interest in anything else I say. So if you compute the heat capacity of the Schwarzschild black hole, uh, well, you can compute the sign of the heat capacity by just taking the second derivative of uh, the entropy, the area with respect to the energy. And given that the area is 16 pi m squared, this computation yields 16 pi, which is bigger than zero. That's a positive eigenvalue. Uh, but that doesn't tell you that Schwarzschild is unstable. It just tells you Schwarzschild, the Schwarzschild black hole has a negative heat capacity. But what I'm telling you is that that tells you that a black brain, any black brain made out of Schwarzschild, in particular the black string, which is just the five-dimensional uh, hmm, I don't know what happened there. Uh, OK. That, OK. So you just take a Schwarzschild black hole, add an extra dimension to get a five-dimensional solution. So you could kind of picture that, again, not in a space-time diagram, but if this is the spherical horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole, we've now added an extra dimension. Uh, and that doesn't look too good, but anyway, we have, that's what the black string looks like. We know already that the black string is unstable. That, that was actually proven by Gregory and Laflamme in the 1990s. But the computation, okay, got more. This computation that taking the second derivative of the area of 16 pi m squared with respect to m and noting that 16 pi is greater than zero is a proof that the black string is unstable. Okay, so now let me so now let me show you this and by the way define canonical energy and all that. Now, so this is all things that we had yesterday. I've actually taken these slides from another talk, so the notation. There are slight notational differences, but this is the, the Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrangian as an n-form. This is the fundamental equation of varying Lagrangian to get Euler-Lagrange equations and this boundary term, which I denoted with a capital theta last time. This is what that theta is, the same formula as I showed you yesterday. Then you get the symplectic current by taking an anti-symmetrized second variation of that, uh, and you define the symplectic form, I call that capital omega yesterday, by integrating the current over a Cauchy surface. 
I didn't specialize this formula to general relativity, but this is the explicit formula for the symplectic form, the, symplectic, the integrated symplectic current in general relativity. It's just the anti-symmetrized product of the metric perturbation on the three slice and the momentum perturbation on the three slice where the momentum perturbation is defined, the momentum, excuse me, is defined in terms of the extrinsic curvature by just, uh, uh, you know, removing this, uh, I, you're not removing the trace, this isn't trace free, but you're subtracting off this uh, trace term. And I've written this now as a density, uh, you know, to be integrated rather than as a, as a form in this formula. Okay, this is another current that I introduced and Piotr also uh, introduced in his talk uh, associated with a diffeomorphism X and this is the formula I gave you last time that the another current always can be written in this form in terms of constraints and the another charge. And then this is the, the well, what I'm calling now the fundamental vari variational identity that you get by varying the another current under a perturbation and equating this to this and using the definition of the, of the symplectic form. In this equation, I haven't made any restrictions at all. In the equations I wrote down, I assumed that the background on which you were perturbing was a solution of the equations of motion. I'm not assuming that uh, now, uh, and the main reason is I want to be sure to have an equation that I can take uh, another derivative of and uh, be uh, and be still valid. I don't want to drop a term that might uh, might have a non-zero derivative, and the reason is well. So again where the metric is our dynamical variable here, and I'm in these variations considering a one-parameter family of metrics, and uh, the delta G is just the derivative with respect to the parameter, but in today's talk, I'm gonna go a step further and take second derivatives, so this is evaluated at lambda equals zero, but I'm also gonna be concerned with taking second derivatives. I took second variations yesterday and they're in these formulas, but then that was, those were two independent variations. Now I'm gonna be wanting to consider some one parameter family of solutions I guess I should put indices on both sides if I'm gonna do it. And I'm gonna to wanna to take, uh, actually take second derivatives with respect to my one parameter in there. But that's getting a little bit ahead of the game, but that's why I've kept all terms uh, in that formula. So I explained to you yesterday that a Hamiltonian would be a function on the phase space or the field configuration space whose variation satisfies this formula and that gives rise with the boundary term at infinity to the formula for ADM conserved quantities. Now I spent some time yesterday getting rid of this delta uh, to try to and doing something about the fact that this wasn't automatically delta of something to get an actual formula for H sub X, the ADM mass or the angular momentum. I don't actually have to do that, bother doing that now because I'm only concerned with the fact, I'll, I'll only need these varied quantities in any of the formulas I'm about to define. Of course, if this wasn't the variation of some quantity, that might be a problem, so it's good to know that it is, but I don't need to uh, introduce that B that I had and so on because I'm only gonna be concerned uh, with this. And then as I explained uh, in the last lecture, uh, if I 
consider the horizon killing field and integrate. So now I am going to, for the first time in this talk, draw a space-time diagram with a bifurcate killing horizon of a black hole and a surface that goes from the bifurcation surface of this killing horizon out to infinity. And if you integrate uh, the fundamental identity there with x chosen to be the killing field, uh, you get the first law of black hole mechanics. And again, this term is 0 because x is a killing field. This is 0 because the background satisfies the equations of motion. This is 0 because the perturbation satisfies the linearized constraints. So all you get is this term. The boundary term from infinity gives you the ADM quantities. And the boundary term at the horizon gives you the, uh, gives you the kappa delta A. And if you have many, if the horizon killing field is a, involves a sum of rotational killing fields, then you just get the sum in higher dimensions uh, appearing here. OK, so now to move on to canonical energy, finally, and give you the, the uh, results. Uh, we want the quantities that we're dealing with to be gauge invariant. Now, the, uh, it will turn out that this canonical energy will not automatically be gauge invariant. I mean, as I'm, I haven't defined it for you as I'm about to define it. But to make something gauge invariant, you can make things gauge invariant by imposing gauge conditions, in which case they're gauge invariant with respect to any remaining gauge freedom. And there is an important and very physically natural gauge condition to impose on the perturbation, which can, for we're, we're only considering the positive non-zero surface gravity case with the bifurcate killing horizon. This, one can show you, always can impose, so there's no physical restriction on the perturbation, which is that uh, the, that the well, in the background horizon, of course, there is zero expansion of the generators. In the perturbation, there might be this, this what you're calling this surface. Well, it might not even be uh, a null surface anymore. But if you, it, what we're, we're only concerned with perturbations of the initial data, what we're going to demand is that the convergence uh, or expansion uh, is what I've written there of these generators at the location that we that was previously the horizon uh, that that expansion vanish. Now, what that actually guarantees is that to first order, what you were what was the horizon of the black hole is still the horizon of the perturbed black hole. So anyway, we impose this gauge condition, and then our definitions will be gauge invariant. And finally, here is the definition of canonical energy. So this is the symplectic product, which requires two perturbations. You've seen this before, today and yesterday, with the two perturbations. You integrate the symplectic current over a Cauchy surface. This gives you a conserved quantity. But it's not tremendously useful since it's a conserved quantity for a pair of perturbations. But now we can choose as the pair of perturbations when we have a background symmetry, whatever perturbation we're interested in, and the time derivative, the Lie derivative uh, of that perturbation. So this gives a conserved quantity for a single perturbation. Uh, and this is a formula that you get for that quantity. So how did I get that formula? Well, uh, we have this 
variational identity, I'm going to take one more derivative with respect to lambda. Now, because this term is zero, I'm only going to get a contribution when the lambda derivative hits the g, and that, when integrated, is going to give me the canonical energy. This is not going to give anything because the equations of motion are going to be satisfied to all orders, and so I'm just going to get these boundary terms. But the boundary terms are just the mass, angular momentum, and area quantities, so when I take another derivative, I'm just going to get the second derivative of those quantities coming in. So the canonical energy defined this way is, in fact, equal to exactly the quantity that has to be positive for thermodynamic stability. So what does that have to do with dynamic stability? Well, with a fair amount of work, well, some of, the, some of these are fairly easy, but, well, it's first of all, even though I'm really interested in this for a single perturbation, you might as well look at this as a quadratic form on pairs of perturbations. And viewed in that way, it's conserved for the same reason as the symplectic product is conserved. It's not hard to show that it's symmetric. Uh, it's with this gauge condition imposed, it's gauge invariant, well, with respect to per perturbations that keep the area and the ADM linear momentum of all things fixed. Uh, but we're going to be interested in perturbations that keep the state parameters fixed, which uh, will automatically keep the area fixed by the first law. And without loss of generality, we can do a Lorentz boost to get rid of any uh, perturbation in the linear momentum. So there's no restriction, physical restriction, on the perturbations here. OK, and now the least trivial of these things uh, is that the, this canonical energy is, in fact, degenerate only on perturbations. So this is the statement of degeneracy. I mean, that this is 0 for all. Uh, so we're only interested in perturbations that keep the state parameters fixed to first order. And this we can do for free. And on that subspace, this is non-degenerate uh, if and only if the gamma is a perturbation toward another stationary and axisymmetric black hole. So uh, on this subspace of perturbations, uh, because it's non-degenerate, it's either positive definite or it can be made negative. Now, I didn't. Uh, yeah, well, okay, that, that's all true. Okay, so if the E is positive definite, we can't have exponentially growing modes because the energy, this E would have to grow exponentially with those exponentially growing modes, and, uh, but, it, but E is constant. So you might ask, what does positive definiteness have to do with it? Well, if it wasn't positive definite, you could have something growing exponentially and something else negatively growing exponentially so that they cancel each other and keep the E conserved. I mean, that uh, you need the positive definiteness to have mode stability. Uh, on the other hand, if... Uh, if you could make E negative, and if the E were to settle down to another stationary axisymmetric black holes at late times, then you'd get a contradiction because non-trivially with a lot of work, you can prove these flux formulas of canonical energy. The canonical energy flux through null infinity is just the bondi news squared. And the canonical energy flux through the horizon is just the shear squared. And the canonical energy then can only decrease. But if you were to asymptotically approach a stationary black hole of the same parameters, it has to be of the same parameters because there can't be a first order at first order because there can't be a first order change in those parameters given that we 
didn't put in any first order change in the first place, uh, the E can only decrease, but it would have to go to zero if you were going to approach a stationary black hole uh, at late times. So this, I, I didn't, I've said axisymmetric in the right places here, but axisymmetry is critical in this formula because this flux is positive for the time translations at infinity. This flux uh, is positive for the horizon killing field. Uh, and only in the presence of axisymmetry are the fluxes associated with the time translation and the horizon killing fields equivalent because you know, we have this relation between the killing fields, but if everything is axisymmetric, we won't have any fluxes associated with the axial killing fields. Okay, so let me just quickly uh, mention to you, since I already built this up, I don't, if we were to consider black brains, well, you have to do some work, but you can, if you have a perturbation that changes the angular momentum, the, the mass or the angular momentum and decreases the canonical energy, if you have that for a black hole, that's not of any interest. That doesn't do anything for you. But if we take one of those black hole perturbations uh, that decreases the canonical energy, uh, multiply that by e to the i k z, then we have to, we've modified the data, so we have to readjust it a bit to satisfy the constraints, and we have to control the fact that we don't change the perturbation all that much to resolve the constraints if we take k to be extremely small, then the new data will satisfy the required conditions, but it will still have negative canonical energy, so it will be unstable. So what I'm saying here is that if you have a black brain based on a black hole that has negative canonical energy that changes the state parameters, then for the corresponding black brain, you can find a perturbation that makes the canonical energy negative, but doesn't change the state parameters to first order, and that, by these arguments, uh, gives you an instability. So have we done everything with linear stability of black holes? Does it just reduce to the computation of canonical energy? Well, there's a, uh, it's restricted to axisymmetric case. Uh, the stability and instability results are weaker than what you'd want. And we're only doing uh, uh, linear theory, too, so one uh, has the re restriction there. But it's also not that easy to tell whether something has positive, whether a black hole background has positive canonical energy or not. And I've saved this sort of for the last to show you the explicit formula for canonical energy. So in this. The notation here is that the H is the metric of the initial data surface over here of the background space time. The Q is the perturbed metric. The uh, pi is the canonical momentum of the background space time. And the P is the perturbed canonical momentum. And this is the first page of the expression for canonical energy. This is the rest of the expression. So what Prebu and I, though, were able to show is that you can break this up into two pieces depending on their T phi reflection symmetry. And in fact, the T phi anti-symmetric part, which would naturally be called the, kin the kinetic energy, that one, can, that's a very simple subset of the terms there compared to the full expression. Uh, that we've been able to show is always positive definite for any black hole or black brain background. That enables us to show that if the potential energy can be made negative, you actually will get, well, with, uh, for suitable perturbations, exponential growth in time. 
uh, if that is negative. Okay, but what I've once again, just as last time, run one minute over, which isn't too bad. Uh, so amazingly, at least with respect to the axisymmetric perturbations, dynamic and thermodynamic stability for a black hole are equivalent, well, equivalent in quotes because I'm using weak notions of stability and instability here, but, uh, but nevertheless, I think it's really remarkable that the laws of black hole thermodynamics uh, extend to stability arguments and the thermodynamic st stability of a black hole is directly re relevant to its physical dynamical stability. So that's it for today and tomorrow we're on to the quantum version of black hole thermodynamics. <laughs>